So thanks, Andrea, for this introduction. I warmly thanks the Institute de, uh, de Física Corpuscular to have me, uh, let me this opportunity to present to you uh, a study which is related to my side activities as a uh, disseminator of the process associated to finite resources. So uh, sort of going to show, uh, I'm going to show you a presentation which is mainly a conceptual presentation. It's almost devoid of formulas. Uh, so I'm going to insist uh, on several concepts which you are going to realize quite soon because you're a physicist that are completely absurd. But they are the basis of our economic, uh, economic um, theory, the, the standard economic theory. And in, in, this is not all the theory which exists today about economics, but it's the main one, the mainstream, the one which has been applied once and again in order to produce uh, the appropriate results to get out of this crisis. Something, well, in fact, this is quite funny because uh, during my um, uh, day work, during the day, I am working in a very specific group which is devoted to understanding how we can measure some specific properties of the ocean using high technology satellites and the like. And by night, I devote myself to explain that the industrial civilization is condemned to, to fail and to collapse. So, so which is quite schizophrenic, but this is my life. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead with, intro, with, the, with talk. The talk is quite long, so please, if you have any question, interrupt me at any instance, OK? And I am going first to explain why physicists should pay attention to economy. And then I'm going to discuss in detail the four, that these are not all the pillars of a modern economic theory, but they are four fundamental ones, and why they are deeply wrong. So first, first of all, I'm going to explain, I'm going to first introduce the four, and then I'm going to discuss into detail why they're wrong. So first, I will, I will discuss on free market commodification, infinite substitutability, and endless growth. And finally, I will explain why classical economists uh, should pay more attention to physics. And, and, and at the end, I will present, present the conclusions and with a call to scientists to, to react. So, so why is this is to pay attention to economy? Because uh, all uh, economic analysis and the design of economical goals are based on uh, measuring some statistical physical quantity. It's measuring, measuring things that, are, that you can touch with physical, 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 physical entities. Entity. Things, things that you can have a real, real measurement in the world. world. Maybe the, the, the relation between some decide on the basis of human decisions, decisions, but they have real specific effects on real world. But when they are designing these laws, as we're going to see, the laws of physics are not taken into account. So of course, the laws of economics are not the same as the laws of the physics. But the laws of physics, of course, imposes constraints on the laws, should impose constraints on the laws that are having applied by the economists. Also, as we are going to explain, recurrently the diagnosis is mathematically very odd. Even I would say it's ill posed. And uh, from that, we are deriving once again some measures which are definitely a, uh, a failure. So half of the evolution of economics during the last 10 years is something that you can easily understand. Also because the continuity of your work and my work depends on the good pace of economy. If we are going to go, go deeper in this crisis, and I can assure you today, we are going to start a new recessive phase. We are going to have a a situation which is similar to 2008 by the, the end of this year, beginning of next year. So this is going to, for sure, to, to affect your careers and your possibilities of have funding and so on. So I think this is quite interesting for you. And at the end, because we can help improving the situation, introducing our standards, tools, and methods. This is not to say that we can substitute economic theory, but we can provide some help. Which these four pillars of classical economy I want to discuss today. The first one is free market, and free market essentially can be summed up, summed up uh, in such a way. The best system to regulate, to regulate all economic relations is free market. Okay, a free market. What's, what first of all, what a free market is? Yeah, because when you say free market, you are uh, understanding something with this term. So the first thing is it, it is efficient. What does it mean? An efficient market is a market which is able to bring, at each instance you have a demand of some good in some place, it's going to get the production of this good in other place and put, the, both, put both together. So it's able to transmit the production to the consumer. 
without any additional charge. Okay, you can have some transaction charge and so on, but anyway, it is operating in an efficient way. The second uh, characteristic of free market is that all agents have equal access to the market. So there are no barriers to enter the market. The market, anyone who wants to go to the market can go there and can operate in the same conditions as anyone else. Another property of free market is all agents have equal access to information because also this is very important. If you want to buy something, you need to, you need to know what you're buying and uh, where you can buy something which is cheaper or expensive, more expensive as you want. The question is, as I'm going to explain later on, that free markets cannot exist in a free state. A free state, I mean a free state without regulation, a state of freedom, it is rather, <laughs> the, uh, I would say, the, the logo of jungle. So it tends to uh, create a, what is called a natural market, which, is the, which tends to be oligopolistic. I'm going to discuss this later on. In fact, the exigency of bringing freedom to the market is not the same as uh, requesting a free market. It's in fact a, strong, a strongly ideological statement, which has nothing to do with free market. I'm going to explain later. I'm, I'm just introducing the concept. I'm putting, just summarizing some properties. After all, I'm going to explain in several slides all the thing. Okay. Commodification. Commodification can be summed up saying all human interactions can be brought to the market. So everything can put a price tag. It means that uh, anything which is meaningful for humans can have, in fact, has a price tag. Conversely, anything which cannot be assigned a price is inexistent in practical terms. It has no, it is not relevant. It's like discussing about soul or ghost, or thing which are not, something which is not uh, interesting in economic terms. It's as if it doesn't exist. Even human relations of any kind can be commoditized. This is what commodization says, and this is the way I'm saying, but what they are saying. Money is the measure of everything. We can talk then about human capital, labor, which uh, in, in more classical economical terms, because we do, something you need to understand is that our present, what we can say classical economy, has in fact just a century and a half of life. It's not so, it's not so old dated as we, we could see. And uh, in previous wars, we, we are talking about labor, now we say human capital, and uh, land, that we say the, the land factor, that now we say natural capital. Everything, everything can be expressed in terms of money. This is what commodization says. Commodification, commodification in fact, is a strongly, uh, strongly ideological assumption, which implies that everything can be expressed in terms of money. And we will see afterwards that it, it can't. Not, not everything can be expressed in terms of money. Well, you all know, but I, I need to explain. Infinite substitutability. At any time that the market runs short of any good, it will, it will find an equivalent substitute in short order. So if you run out of whatever, you are going to find a replacement for this thing, and you are going to obtain it like that. Very easily, very easily. It will be price signals brought to the market, and the market will react, creating an appropriate substitute for this. This can sound very naive, but this is really what they are saying. This is really what they are saying. Infinite substitutes at the market via price signals create adequate incentives for substitutes to appear. So once you realize that everything, uh, something is becoming scarce, something is becoming very expensive, something will pop up. Uh, some technological breakthrough take, will take place, and you will have, a, uh, uh, in short term, uh, a substitute. According to this hypothesis, then, innovation is just a question of money. Yeah? So breakthrough innovation just requires more money. It's a question of money. Everything is money. It's, it's, it has a lot of do, to do with commodification. Timing is not, a, is not a constraining variable. No matter the complexity of substitution, substitutions orderly appear when required. Infinite substitutability is worse than ideological assumption. It is a kind of magic. It's a kind of magic of, or religion, because it's a kind of belief. You believe that because you happen to, to need something, something is going to appear. And this is not the case, unfortunately. Endless growth. Growth is good and it's equivalent to wealth, which is not true. But growth can continue forever unabated. As growth is equated to wealth, 
only, only force in standard economic thought are put, are put in maximizing growth. And you can see this all the time in the news. We need to have this GDP increase every year in order to create uh, uh, labor places, in order to have a good, healthy economy, in order to have more budget for science, and so on. All the emphasis is putting growth. It doesn't mind, it doesn't mind uh, how much wealth you have, which is your present production. What is important is the increase of this production. All the statistic indicators of the economic activity in a regime like GDP must grow in a healthy economy. The goal for enterprises at any level is to grow, just to grow. And this is the kind of thing a CEO of a company is required when presenting a, its quarter, the results of the company. It's always his, he or she is going to be always pushing the direction of increasing the revenues of the company by a certain percentage. From assumptions, growth is in fact the most controversial one. Because there's something here, in, uh, you're physicist, so I'm sure that you're thinking how growth can be. But you have heard a lot of times in the, on the TV how growth can be possible in endless growth in a fifth planet. So there's something here we need to give. Okay? But in fact, for that reason, it is rarely seriously debated. In fact, endless growth is more than a strongly geological assumption, what it is. But it is the very fabric of capitalism. It's essential to capitalism to continue. I'm going to explain later on why. And then, for that reason, as we don't want to abandon capitalism, it is unquestionable. We cannot question growth, even if it is impossible. Now I'm going to explain, in more than just make the presentation and summarize of the things I'm going to explain during the talk. I am going to I am going now to go into the details. The talk, I'm sure, is, is full of concepts and so on. You are going to have later on a, a copy of the presentation. And at any time you want to question me, you can. I mean, even if when I back to Barcelona and so on. Uh, just this, the presentation is rather a roadmap, just to give you hints on, on subjects that maybe you want to, to go deeper. So marketing efficiencies first. So what's wrong with free market? Because market has a lot of noun inefficiencies. For instance, ma markets can only efficient provide, efficiently provide public go goods. A public good is something which is called a, a, a non readable good, which means that anyone can access it for free. For instance, a road. For instance, you are putting uh, lamps on the, on the street. This is a public good because anyone passing by is going to benefit from the lamp. If you are going by a way, you are going to benefit from them. And this is not quite, it's not easy to put this on the market. For instance, with roads, something that we can do, uh, for instance, for, uh, with highways, is try to put some kind of pole. But I, I think that you know what has happened with this new arrays of uh, highways with poles that they have put, <laughs> they brought to the market. Now, the question is, yes, the question is, if you provide something that anyone can access, it's, you cannot make a profit from it, yeah, in a, in a standard market. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's not a question of price, it's a question of marketization. You cannot bring it into the market because if anyone can benefit from it, how you can force this person to pay? You cannot do, you can do this by the, by the market. You can do this by taxes. Because, and this is the reason for which public goods needs to be regulated by a state or by some kind of minister. Exactly. This is what a public good means. So, but, yeah, but this is, but public goods are much more common. Huh? No, free, they are not free because if I'm putting a public lamp in a, on a street, this is not free. This has a cost. It's for, for free riding, yes. Can that be that it has some relationship with the ownership of the goods you are buying? So in the sense, you cannot buy the lamp that is produced by the lamp set. Yeah. So if you are not the owner, so this cannot be priced. No, but it's not a question of ownership because you can you can be the owner of the lamp. Anyway, you can be the one who has paid for the lamp. Huh? Yeah, but the lamp producing the light has a cost because you need electricity. I understand. I'm saying what you cannot price is something that you cannot. No, but no, no, no. It has a price. It has a price. It cannot be brought to the market. Well, Okay, I'm sure, yes, 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 because price is, well, you have a cost and then you are required for a price in a market. The question is, in fact, yes, all right, you, it has a cost and it cannot be brought to the market. 
because it's a public good. Public goods include a lot of things, which now we tend, because we are, we are tending to marketize everything, that we tend to create for things which are, have been considered historically uh, as public goods, we try to bring into the market, for instance, public security instead of police and things of the like. So even in some sense, you can try to produce uh, private laws, laws, regulations, in favor of some private interests. It can sound a bit bizarre to you, but this is exactly what this uh, treaty between the United States is, uh, how do you say, the Inter-Atlantic Treaty. I don't know if you are aware of this. Well, I will explain this later on. Okay. So, adverse selection. This is another noun market inefficiency. It is not, it is not possible to marketize high risk or low profit activities because there is non appropriate price tag for it. It's something similar to this. I said some uh, services that the, you want to provide, but the question is that the, the price to cover your cost are always um, insufficient. I mean, the price to cover your cost is, has not enough public to be paid. So you put a, sell a given price and then your public uh, falls, the amount of people willing to buy this product uh, falls. So you need to rise again the price, and then the amount of people willing to pay is even lower and lower and lower, and in fact, there is no equilibrium point because uh, your product is a high risky one or a low profit one. This is what usually we call services. And again, this needs to be, you want to have this because you, 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 I mean, the society finds it useful or important to have this. This is something that needs to be paid via taxes with a public system. Okay. But it's different from the previous one because the previous one is a question that is you, you cannot identify who to pay. This one you can identify who to pay, but there is no equilibrium price. Natural monopolies. I am going to explain in a greater detail afterwards. So they have, they may, you may have access barriers. You have some kind of uh, business that in fact requires a previous investment which is so big that in fact quite few actors can access. And that, in fact, implies that there is no competency. So this is going to imply a monopoly. A monopoly is in, a, in something that this is a non-regulated market, which is not the same as free market. It's quite, it's quite uh, noxious. The tragedy of commons, I'm going to explain in the following slides. And the tendency of create oligopolies that I'm going to explain in the, in the following slides. OK. Something which is uh, also quite common in, in marketization, in, the, in this abuse of understanding the market can regulate any activity, is that if the only driver of market is own profit, producers have all the incentives to externalize any charge. So any cost that they can um, endorse to anything, anyone else, they are going to put it there. If anyone else is, is amended to pay, so this is good. <laughs> Uh, classical examples. So this is examples which are happening right now, right today. This is a copper, a copper mine in the United States. So something that you should know is that copper mines are quite exhaustive. So the the, the richness of the ore, the grade of the ore, which is said, is now quite a scarce. Typically, um, with a mine like this, you have a concentration of uh, the pyrite, which is the the mineral of, of copper in this case, of uh, one over the ten thousand. So you need to go with very heavy machinery and drag rocks and so on to remove at 10 tons of rocks to obtain a kilogram of pit, and then you need to refine and so on. Uh, the extraction of the spirit from the rocks is typically uh, performed using a technique which is called leaching. So you create a pond with water, you put an acid there, and then you uh, dump inside uh, the mineral, then you extract from the bottom the mineral, there. and you then leave the pond there. Leave the pond there, and you don't care. And then the enterprise maybe disappears, like something. I mean, after taking the profits, and the pond is there, and then the pond at some point breaks out, and then it freezes. It freezes a lot of contaminated and strongly acidic or strongly alkaline water then typically burns everything on, on its path. This kind of accident, uh, I'm putting this example here. I don't know if you remember in the Czech Republic uh, three winters ago, there was one of these very huge ponds that break out and created a wave for uh, orange-brown uh, water that, in fact, you couldn't touch because it burned. It happened 20 years ago, I think, 
in Al 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 Alcoriar, here very close to Doñana Park in Spain. It was exactly the same thing, of, uh, the same kind of thing. This is the reason for which this kind of practice now are very strongly uh, surveyed in the European Union and in the United States, and in fact it is forbidden to do this. But this is, con this is the kind of thing which is continuing to be done, especially in China. China, which is presently providing us with very rare earths and specific methods they are doing by this technique because it's the only one to start the thing when they are so diluted. So this is a kind of externalization. You make, you create a mess and then well, you run out. <laughs> I'll leave someone else to manage the mess, okay? Uh, there are lots. Presently, there are lots of externalities created by the normal functioning of our economy, the normal functioning of our industries. For instance, air pollution. Air pollution is imparcated by factories, imparcated by the exhaust tubes of the, of the vehicles. And something that you need to know is that one over eight, one over eight deaths on the world right now are caused by air pollution. For, eight, for every eight, eight persons who dies right now, right today, one over eight will be a cause because air pollution. This is not my, my statement by, the, by one made by the World Health uh, Organization. Something which is, it is especially uh, serious in, in countries like China, but it's also important here. Diesel is quite nauseous for, for human beings. Water pollution, something that um, I think that you also know. Water is quite contaminated in some places. You can, have, you can hardly get uh, drinking water. Um, sea pollution, no? this is uh, something which concerns, concerns me. I don't know, you know that by the, in the center of the northern Pacific, there is a huge garbage patch, as big as twice Texas, which is formed by plastic debris floating around. In some places, they even create islands. All the uh, ecosystems are contaminated. Feces die in massive numbers by millions. Even, I mean, seagulls, everything. Everything at that place have a lot of troubles. They are dying in massive numbers. That's because the United States here, they dump the plastic in some, in some places, and then they, they finish by runoffs from the rivers or whatever. They, it finishes in the, on the sea and it tends to concentrate due to uh, ocean circulation, tends to concentrate by the center of the tropical gyre. And then you have a patch, a huge patch over there. Not, not, not that this one, this is quite as exaggerated, but well, anyway, twice the size of Texas. It's not a small. Float. Yes, floating. Uh, some more, sometimes also precipitation. This is quite complicated, but it, it, at, at the end, it interferes all the trophic chain. Massive dumping, well, you know, they have a lot of dumping there. Even we have countries which are specialized, specialized dump, dumpsters. There are places in which we are, for instance, dumping our, our electronic waste, which is quite contaminated in Africa, maybe. And climate change. So I'm coming from an institute of environmental sciences, so I need to talk to you a little about climate change for sure. So climate change. Sea level rise. This is the thing you have been repeated a lot of times, and this is a typical map. So we have the evolution of the arrays of just, I think, seven or 10 meters, I don't remember exactly, but how the world will look like after a rise of about 10 meters of, the, of sea levels, taking into account that if all the Antarctica, all Greenland um, glaciers were to, to, to melt, uh, sea level rise will, the, the rise, the sea level will rise by about um, between, uh, 50 to 70 meters. So this is just the beginning. This is not something that is going to happen tomorrow. It takes centuries to have to this level. But just to, uh, to see how the world will like. Quite good for Spain, not so good for Valencia or for Barcelona, for sure. <laughs> and another problem related to, um, to climate change and the dumping of uh, CO2 to the atmosphere is ocean acidification. Ocean dissolves the uh, surplus of uh, CO2. And this uh, um, decreases the pH of water, so the uh, water becomes more acidic. And this, for instance, has strong, a strong impact on, on corals, which are not able to fix uh, the, the, uh, the, the calcium carbonates and so on. And it starts to dissolve and take into account that it is quite important for a big bunch of uh, ocean marine life. So this is a quite a critical thing. 
changes in uh, new migration patterns, I think which is, as has been observed, has started to be observed, is that uh, species tend to go northwards or southwards. I mean, anyway, uh, they are fleeing the equator. They're going to um, higher latitudes uh, because the temperature is much more similar to the temperature we, they have before or something also in some cases related to changes in the circulation patterns. Weather extremes, something that uh, it's uh, recently uh, has an increased at attention on this problem. So it's not only a question of the rising of the average temperature, but also that we are going to suffer, we are start to suffer increases in the number of extremes. For instance, this uh, uh, um, uh, explosive psychogenesis of past year in the Cantabric Sea and the North Atlantic the uh, intrusion of the polar vortex in the states during the winter, even during the summer, uh, or for instance, the drought, the strong drought they have now in California. And well, here you, it seems you have had a more or less normal uh, summer, except that you, you have no rain. <laughs> but in our case, we have almost no summer. In the northern part of Spain, we have almost no summer. I, I think that this year I went three times to the beach. And uh, this is not so critical, but my main concern was that when we was going to my garden, we were unable to gather tomatoes because tomatoes didn't get mature. Well, this make uh, this is a, a funny thing, but when you think, for instance, that uh, this year the harvest uh, of uh, wheat in France was an 18% lower than the, than the average, which is caused by the excess of rain and so on, this is not so funny. And something which is also related, uh, we, have, we are observing the start of changes in circulation patterns. This is the modification of a very strong current which separates the circulation of air in, uh, in the middle latitudes from the higher latitudes. Typically, you have here the polar vortex. And there is an interface which is called the jet stream. The jet streams, the strength of the jet stream depends on the gradient of temperature between the equator and the North Pole. As, as the North Pole is becoming warmer faster than the equator, so this, this barrier has been awakened, and now we have something like this, a quite complicated uh, setup of meanders and so on, which implies that the circulation of uh, air masses are more meridional, more north to south, and less um, zonal, less uh, uh, west to east. So this creates very complicated patterns, uh, something which is, for instance, strange in the case of, of Catalonia when I, when I arrived. Uh, is that typically we have by the end of summer we have a typical before we have a typical tempest coming from from the sea coming from the east and this is over now we have a repetition of tempest coming from the Atlantic Sea which are able to, to attain us and this is related to this and this can create a lot of trials in the future so this is just as more climate change and this is well kind of externalities that nobody of course is covering up nobody is paying for this. Well, we are going to pay, but in a different way. <laughs> Another market inefficiency, something related to what we were discussing previously, the tragedy of commons. This is something which is quite nonsense a century ago, and uh, it was rebrought to actuality in 1968. So <laughs> it means some 40 years ago. So the tragedy of commons, what does it mean? That in, on a purely rational basis, just uh, applying market rules, the more rational exploitation of common goods, goods which are from, uh, which are nobody's goods, are everyone's goods in some sense, is uh, to get it the, to get exploited and take their entire destruction, because nobody owns it, owns them. I'm going to explain why. So traditional selling of commons. Let's suppose that we have a pasture and we have uh, three owners with uh, their cattle. So each one of them have a cow, and they go to the common pasture and then they let the, the cows to graze there. And they apply the same rules as their fathers, uh, and the father's fathers, and the fathers of the fathers of the fathers, and well, in countless generations uh, beyond memory. So each one of them knows that to this pasture in particular, they can just bring out a cow to graze there, okay? Oh, so, which is the situation, so, which is a marginal grazing profit for each one of these uh, cows. They graze for an area of a size G, so they take profit, they generate milk and, and, and meat, okay? And then uh, if the total area of this pasture is A, so you need to uh, remove the part that the, the cows have grazed, so 3G, okay? 
and you have a regeneration factor which is R. And this is the part which is regrowing from year to year. Okay? So, provided that this quantity is enough to restart the thing, there is no problem. Next year, you are going to have the same area A covered by pasture that the cows can graze. Okay? Marginal, if you don't understand the term, is for each one of the of the owners. So for each one of them is G. Okay? Um, so let's suppose that we apply a market logic on that. So, well, so why not to put an additional cow? So you put an additional cow, your marginal grazing profit will be G for the first cow, and the second one, there is always a diminution return term that I mobilize here quite easily by a factor D, which is a sm a, a smaller than one, which is between zero and one, DG for the second cow, or for the joint uh, amount of cows, D plus DG. The amount of milk, the amount of meat, flesh they are going to produce, is D plus DG, okay? But now you are grazing, as every, every owner is making the same, you are grazing six times G. So th this, the, the, the decrease in area is A minus six, uh, six G, and then the radiation factor R, so to, to produce, okay, to regenerate all the pasture. And well, uh, if you put an additional amount of cows, maybe you can obtain a greater profit and so on. So finally, you put as much cows as possible because you can, even if the profit is decreasing, for any additional cow, you are still uh, gaining some additional revenue. So in the end, you put an infinite amount of cows. <laughs> So you will have that your marginal, marginal grazing, I mean, not infinite, but uh, a number n of cows, uh, you, your marginal uh, profit will be like this, okay? So as you increase n, d is uh, smaller than one, so this is decreasing, so this part is increasing, so you are gaining maybe less at each time, the, there is a diminishing returns low. But the problem is that the, you are severely affecting the amount of area that you are affecting by your grazing. So as fast as you are arrive to this point in which the new surface regenerative from the remaining pasture is smaller than the amount the cows are going to graze, the pasture will collapse. And this is typically observed. This is something that has been observed a lot of times. And this is the reason for which, for instance, here in Valencia, there is a famous Tribunal de las Aguas, the, their water tribunal, which decides how some, some common, which is quite a scarce, which is water, is distributed between the people who want to irrigate with them. So this is a typical example, the trade of commons, of uh, how market rules cannot be applied because for, if you are looking just for your own profit, you will destroy the common. And this is, well, this has been observed a lot. And for instance, in the Mediterranean Sea, there's a significant example with red tuna. I don't know if you are aware of this, but we have almost exterminated red tuna because we are just applying the same logic. And there are just uh, eight, eight uh, people, eight, enterprises fishing red tuna in the, in the Mediterranean. But taking just the logic of uh, the profit, you are not going to renounce to a one profit if your neighbor is going to take profit, putting an additional cow, putting an additional sheep. So at the end, you end up destroying the, the common. Okay, I am simplifying a lot, just for the benefit of discussion. The question is, anyway, uh, apart from this uh, simple example, this is what really happens. This happens in reality. We have many historical examples in which some particular common good has been let alone, it has been let free to for exploitation, and the most logical egoistic uh, position is try to exploit it for an additional marginal profit, and finally you end up by destroying it completely. Of course, if you introduce some regulation, so you are wakening the coupling, you can obtain a chaotic behavior, or you can obtain unstable behavior. But you need to introduce regulation to do that. So this is not ma free market in the sense of uh, a market with freedom, which is not exactly the same as free market. But this is just to, uh, uh, the problem of uh, tragedy of commons is just to exemplify that this is the kind of interaction which cannot be regulated by markets. Just the, the market rules are not enough to this. We need to introduce some additional ru rules. For instance, at the Tribunal de las Aguas de Valencia. It means you need some uh, greater authority Imposing, no, no, we are going to manage this in such a way. So you are not let alone to decide how you will manage. There is a common ruling organization. Okay? So this is contrary, I mean, any ruling or, uh, organization is contrary to market, to market rules, to, apply, to the uh, uh, other application of uh, market rules at any time. 
I'm going to go ahead because there is still a lot of stuff here, and the most interesting is by the end of the talk, which is for sure. So, um, and equal access to market and to information. I'm just discussing the first one of the of the pillars, and there are four. Uh, and equal access to the market and to information. So real world markets are unequal. So it's something that you know. So not everyone can access exactly the same to the market. So for instance, purchases are not provided full information on what they, they buy. There is an illusion of choice. So the last time you went to a supermarket and you purchased, for instance, a yogurt, I'm sure you don't know how this yogurt was exactly produced. Do you know if there were sulfites inside or pesticides uh, were used in the elaboration of these? Maybe the cows uh, were uh, um, raised using transgenic uh, corn, or maybe they have been applied uh, steroids or whatever to increase the production. You don't know. You have not full information on that. You have not. You can't have. So uh, there is an illusion of choice. I'm going to explain afterwards why. But the question is, in fact, you take, go there, you just see the, I, I'm sure that none of you really read all the tag on the. But why you are not doing that? This is a good part of. We don't do that because uh, we don't have time or we, don't, we are not interested enough. The question is whether that information exists somewhere where I could access it if I want. It's not I, on the label of the product. Yeah. But why? But okay, we're physicists, so we want to observe one particular behavior of one one individual. This may be by chance. When you have a statistical of individuals behaving the same, there is something more than that. I mean, there is, in some sense, we are not constrained by individuals to react in a given way. So, just to put an example, let's say 40 years ago, you were going to buy the milk of a local uh, racer somewhere. Uh, he has a, uh, his cattle and whatever. And well, you observe, for instance, that this milk was not so good, or maybe uh, the cows uh, have tuberculosis or fever or whatever. This happened, really. And the people decide not to get from this guy. Or maybe you know that, for instance, this guy was producing um, grapes, but the grapes, uh, his land was better or worse, and you were deciding to get this or that one. This is the way in which actually economy worked some 40, 50 years ago. You like that. Right now, everything has been homogenized, and in fact, you have not given this information because, of course, the complexity, the complexity of present society makes it quite difficult to you to access that information. And also, you have the feeling that this is not so important. You have said, okay, well, I have no time, and this is not so important. But maybe it is. Maybe it is. If you have some, somebody in your family who has some allergies or some uh, food, uh, how to say it, um, intolerances and so on, maybe it has been caused because of that. Maybe. It, just to put an example, it repays the same, for instance, in when you are buying a car, when you are buying whatever. In fact, you have not all the information. And in fact, maybe some customers have reported that this was not a good product. And in fact, if you dig deep in the consumer organizations or you dig deep in the internet pages, maybe you find that this specific uh, product from this brand is not very good because such and such and such a thing. But this information is not uh, uh, hom homogeneously equally accessible to, to everyone. But the, problem, the question is inequality. I am not saying this is impossible or in, to access. What I mean is that not, not, anyone, not anybody is accessing this information. And from a statistical point of view, taking into account the difference between uh, among all of us, so there are some people which, is, which are more concerned and go and inform themselves. But there is also a, a statistical fraction of people which inform better. And you need to take the average. The average is that you have an equal access to the information of the market. As respect to the providers, the providers, in fact, they have a lot of information. You, get, you will get surprised how much information they have about the products and the productive uh, steps which are, which are taken to get the product to the market and to understand if it is going to be profitable. And they also make discount the possible shoes they can have because of some problems associated to their productive uh, system. No, 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 they're not lying. No, 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 just to be, to be sure, they're not lying. They are not lying. They give the information. 
they provide information following the laws, following the rules. So the, the, the information is hard to, to obtain. The access to information is not equal. It's not easy for, easy, for you, it's not easy. I'm going to, to show some examples later on. Okay? The information that they are obliged to. Um, the, exactly. But in fact, they are putting a lot of information. I mean, they're putting mainly all the information they have. But the question is, not, it's not easy to access. It is not easy. To, no, 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 but no, I, I'm going beyond the question with the tag of the product. If you want, for instance, maybe, just to put an example, something, somebody in your family becomes ill and it may be happened uh, because of something in one of the foods you have consumed. And you want to figure out which food in particular is creating this problem. How are you going to, to figure out? It's going to be quite hard for you. It will not be so hard 50 years ago. And I am speaking about food because it's something which, okay, it touches you a lot because normally, well, we all have somebody who has had a problem with this kind of thing. But it, it implies any product, in fact. Just to say that not everyone has equal access to information. So what I mean is this is not a free market by definition because by definition of free market you have equal access to information. Yeah. There is no real competence. In fact, there is a concentration of providers. So we have the illusion that we have a lot of choices. But in fact, when you go to supermarkets, you go into the details, and if you read the tax, <laughs> you will discover that, in fact, all these solvents over here, plenty of uh, milky products daily and so on, in fact, are provided by just five companies. All this plethora of things here. In our real world, in your supermarket, I provide by five, maybe four, sometimes three providers. So there is no real, com no, there is no real competence. In fact, typically, all the sectors tend to concentrate. And this process has accelerated during the past years. It is not only about food; it's about, about more or less anything else. When you take any product you want, computers, cars, uh, food, whatever, whatever. Uh, I mean, uh, clothes, whatever. You'll observe that 80% of the market typically is ruled by three, four, five, sometimes seven companies. This is not a real uh, equal market. The concentration, oligopolics tend to, oligopolistic practice, tend to create no, com no, 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 no competence, uh, tend to uh, distort the mechanisms for creating prices and so on. The example of spin glasses. So, Without further constraint, markets tend spontaneously to coalesce in oligolipolistic styles. And regulations play the same rule as temperature. So you let's suppose that you have a temperature which is greater than the critical temperature. You have a lot of different clusters of spins in your system. As you reduce regulations, you reduce temperature, the clusters tend to coalesce, to tend to create greater clusters, uh, um, uh, starting startingly small uh, uh, concentration point it starts to grow, it starts to grow, and the greater it grows, the easier for it for it is to grow even further. The greatest companies buy, buy more and more other small companies, and they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is what happens in a market with no regulation. In a no-regulation market, what you observe, find observe is that you have two, three, four different clusters of options, and all the rest have disappeared, have been absorbed. So this is the analogy of what happens in a, in a market which is free, which is not the same as a free market. Free market, by definition, is efficient, equal access, equal information. And when the market is like this, it's not free market anywhere, any longer. OK? Second pillar. <laughs> What's wrong with commodification? Not all human interactions are profit-oriented. Classical examples are family, friends, non-governmental organizations, church, schools, health. These are the classical examples of uh, uh, human interactions which are not profit-oriented, classically. Commodification has put a price tag on some classical, classically non-profit-oriented activities, for instance, uh, schools and health. And this is something that in Valencia I, I think you have verified a lot. Also, <laughs> on what? <laughs> yeah. Other are seriously disrupted by commodification, for instance, friends and NGOs. 
I mean, uh, the interaction with friends sometimes are quite mediated by, uh, by commodification, by the interaction, by goods, by price tags. I mean, I need to bring a present to this person, to my friend, whatever. I mean, it's quite stupid. In the case of NGOs, uh, they tend to have uh, a structure quite similar to enterprises as they grow up. They typically tend to behave exactly the same as enterprises. Only a few of those sectors are left aside as they're available for, profiting, uh, for providing uh, core values, for instance, family and charge, that are however commoditized in a different way. So you, you tend to observe that, uh, I mean, uh, the commercials, advertisement in TVs tend to, well, they say to provide some cliches how the relations on family or whether values uh, need to be uh, organized so they can be assigned a price tag. I mean, you can uh, have um, a money coming from this activity. Market over rates fluxes in front of stocks. There is no scarcity signal. So uh, there, is, there are several studies saying, okay, an efficient free market, a market which is really efficient, uh, signals uh, the point at which a commodity approaches a scarcity point. So as far as you're getting closer and closer to the point in which something becomes a scarce, there is a rule which is called Hotelling Rules, which in fact it describes a transition phase. So the price experiences a behavior with like a power law of the amount of re remaining resources with a given exponent that can, which can be calculated. So prices undergoes a phase transition. So in some sense, uh, you could anticipate that uh, there is going to be a scarcity because the price behaves in a, big, in a particular way. Okay. However, some unsustainable commodities have become scarce without ever signaling it before the price shock. So do we typically should have a run of time in which you observe an ex um, uh, a power law behavior some years before the arrival of a shocking point, but this has not been the case, in the, for instance, in the case of oil. This is a, um, um, a panel get from a paper published in Nature some two years ago, and what you observe here is how the price and availability of oil, of crude oil, behaved during the past uh, about 10 years. So we have this, these are the, the amount of crude oil produced by day, expressed in million barrels for, per day, and this is the price tag, the average price tag for each one of these point, it, it represents a month. So what we observe here is that we have a regime here which is quite elastic. You increase a little the price you, you are willing to pay and you increase a lot the amount of oil which is being produced. So uh, the oil is re reacting to the signals of market. And starting from 2005 and going, the, the, there is a change, a sharp change in, in, in behavior. And this is not a, this is not a process I know have you know, shown the, the, the evolution of price, but uh, it is not a typical hotel in uh, prediction of having a uh, power law behavior depending on the time. But we have on the contrary a sharp transition from 2005 on, onwards in which you observe that you need to, lo to change a lot of the price just to change a little the amount of oil being produced. The production has, been, has become inelastic. It doesn't matter how much you're willing to pay, you are going to obtain substantially greater amounts of oil. I will explain later on, later on why, why this happened. In fact, it happens because we arrived to peak oil in 2005. So the problem is that market is short deterministic. So market is profit oriented. And so today benefit is overrated in front of future scarcity. So it's something similar to the tragedy of commons. It is better to have some benefit today than to reserve and stock for later use. So the hotel is not being applied. Uh, market is not reflecting the scarcity of the, of the product. And just putting a price tag as commodity edification is saying is not enough. It's not enough to know when something is going to become scarce. Another problem with commodification, and this has to do with a real commodity, is that energy, in fact, is not another, is not yet another commodity. Energy, you know, is the capability of doing work. I mean, in economical terms, it's the capability of doing work. So it's a reserve for possible work. In fact, we are talking about sources of energy. We should rather uh, talk about sources of exergy, uh, useful work. Something which is well known since long ago is that the GDP of the planet, this is the GDP expressed in constant dollars to, to get rid of the effect of inflation, and also in purchase parity power, so the, we are discounting the effect of changes in the in currencies. 
And this, is in, this graph is presented the evolution of GDP of world in front of the evolution of the amount of energy consumed by the world. And what you observe here is that as the GDP increases, the amount of energy also increases. They are very strongly linked. And this is normal because, in fact, oil is a pre-requirement to growth. If you are not able to produce products, if you are not, have not energy to create an, a new product, you have no energy to move your truck, to transport your goods, to move your machine, you are not able to produce any additional service or good, which is exactly what is being measured by GDP. So in classical economic view, uh, energy uh, is another commodity. And what I'm saying is that, in fact, energy is a requirement in order to have economic activity. I'm going to skip this one, not to complicate further the discussion. And I'm going to pass this quite fast. Just to give you a glimpse, I'm going to explain this later in the evening. But yeah, I'm going to go fast. So we are, in a, are now in a very bad situation in which, in fact, all, OK, all commodities, all energy commodities are attaining their maximum rates of extraction without no possibility of increasing it any further because it's not a question of price. It's a question of the energy gain. You consume energy to produce energy. It doesn't matter how, which is the price you want to pay. And you need to have a good thermodynamic balance in order to have a good energy production. So what is happening, in fact, is that peak oil, the, amount, the maximum rate of extraction of oil was attained nine years ago. And now we are discussing it without all the other oils we are able to keep on producing the same amount of energy from oil as we are producing right now. And it seems you are not going to be able. So this, what I, as I will explain this, this evening, uh, we are in a crisis which is never going to end. The problem with peak oil is that, in fact, uh, you have a balance between the energy you need to extract oil and the amount of energy oil is providing you. So taking this into account, what we are observing right now is, in fact, Crude oil, which is the 90% of all oil being produced, attained its maximum in 2005, and we are, we are in the ninth year in a row of decreasing oil production, crude oil. With other non-conventional oils, some substitutes of oil, which are, in fact, in general, not very good, we're still discussing when exactly we're going to attain the maximum rate. It seems we are very close to. It may, it may happen next year. And the question with this is that the energy, the, the energy availability for our society is going to decrease in the following years. It's not a question of getting, uh, getting, uh, how to say, uh, getting a uh, whole oh, uh, It's not a problem of running up. It's not a problem of running up of oil. It's a problem of running short of oil. It's running out or running short. The problem is this one. So you are not going to exhaust the oil. The amount of oil every year is going to be there. Produce more, you spend more. False. Completely false. This is the classical economic approach. And this has been demonstrated. This is completely false. It's not a question of money. It's a question of energy. Because you have a balance between the energies. You still have a lot of uh, aspects, a lot of so difference between, between so the Well, you want the false. Completely false. You can, if you want to express this in, in, in economical terms, I'm going to discuss this later on. The problem is that the price tag you need to put on that is so expensive that you can't afford it. You can't That's afford it. Story. It's the same story, in fact. It's the same story. Because, well, I'm going to skip this. False. False again. This is what you have uh, been, you have read on the on the news, and this is false. United States is a net importer of oil. The United States. I know. Will. This is not United States. This is Canada, as you as you're saying. You are, but you are, excuse me, you are now introducing the question with, excuse me, I, I am a real specialist on that, what you are saying. So you are talking now about Canadian tar sands, which is a different stuff. Canadian tar sands have another problem. First of all, they have a very low energy profit. And then you need natural gas in order to produce oil from them. You need first gas in order to fluidize the, the, the bitumen, because it's the bitumen, it's not oil, it's bitumen, it's a greasy thing. You know bitumen, okay? Brea. 
okay? And then you need additional amount of natural gas to upgrade it in the refinery to convert something to similar to a, a, a liquid hydrocarbon. Canadian tar sands has a lot of limitations, a lot. So even if, even if right now, yeah. Yeah, you're saying that United States. No, it's not. No, no. It's, it's, you're confusing gas with oil. You have first said oil, and then you are now you're saying gas. Excuse me. In the United States, they are not really exporting. They are not net exporters. Net exporters, which is different of exporting. Every country, even in Spain, it's exporting oil. Spain is exporting because we are taking false. If you are talking about, you can say you this is false. The United States now produces 90 percent of the gas it consumes. And regarding oil, it produces 50% uh, of the oil it consumes. 50%. So it is quite far. In the case of, ga of gas, it could attain, it will, will be able to keep the pace. In two, three years, it, will be, be, it could be a net export of gas. It is not going to happen anyway. But in the case of oil, it's very far from being a net export of oil. Okay? But yes, you read a newspaper and they say, the United States are closing to uh, energy independence. This is false. Okay. <laughs> something I wanted to say because you were saying, okay, if, if the price is enough, you will be able to produce something. This is not. This is false. I wanted to have highlight this report, which is a report uh, uh, requested. I mean, created by the a study. Um, how to say? Well, uh, of a, a company has a cabinet of studies. Uh, this this company is called Tulet Premon. This is an intermediation financial um, firm. So this is a city, a Wall Street uh, operator, and they they making a, 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 a report on the thermodynamics of economy, and their conclusions were quite were quite thrilling. They say money is the language of rather than the substance of the real economy. So more than money is just tokens, it's a token, it's a proxy, but what you really need is energy. Energy is the the, the matter you are really exchanging. So ultimately, the economy is and always has been. A surplus energy equation governed by the law of thermodynamics, not those of markets. So you're saying, if uh, if there is the resources there and I'm investing enough money, I will get the oil. If this is the same as saying, if I have enough energy, I'm yeah. I'm but you have, but you want energy to produce energy at the point. Yeah, at some point, you won't be able. To, and at that point, that's it. We are arriving to this point. Very far from that. No. Okay. You need, really, you need to study the facts. You need to study the facts. Why are you saying you are far, far from that? Because you have not studied it, I have a study. So if you can give, provide me a fact. But uh, if you can provide me a fact stating why you say we are far from this point, I will discuss on that. I can provide you a lot of facts saying exactly the contrary what you're saying. This we can discuss after. Okay. I will go on the What's wrong with infinite, infinite uh, substitutability? Resources are necessary infinite supply. So this is what is expected. This is, uh, you have a, a group here in Zaragoza which are working on XRG balances for different commodities, not only energy commodities, but also, as you say, uh, metal. They have made several forecasts with several scenarios setting up and so on. Taking into account that the concentration of the ores, the grid of the ores, become more and more, uh, small, uh, get smaller and smaller because we are half exhausted first the good quality ores and now we are going to the scarcer ones. What we are observing is that in several decades, still five, five decades or so on, we can arrive to the maximum productivity point for iron or aluminum. But in the case of copper, we are saying several years from now. And this is going to be a problem. If you make a, a substitution, we, we are going to electrific, uh, electrificate everything uh, using renewable sources and so on. You need to have copper because if not, your your doses by uh, transfer are going to be quite high. And we are saying that we are very close to attaining the maximum productivity of copper. And afterwards, we are going to have a, a, a smaller amounts of copper every year. So it's not a question of running out; it's a question of running short, not having enough to keep on the same pace. Possible substitutes for a resource are necessarily infinite and not too big number. Well, I'm going to skip this a little. Um, well, this is, I'm going to also skip because if not, I'm not going to attain. But I want to explain a bit more detail the question of oil. So this is the actual production of 
every uh, liquid hydrocarbon during the last years. This graph starts in 60, uh, 66 million barrels per day. So all the part you are not seeing is conventional oil, crude oil. As you are saying here, since 2011, it has seen an irreversible decline. So it was oscillating since 2005, 2008. It was oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down. And now it has started to decline, OK? But we have other hydrocarbons to make up. The first important one to earn in action were biofuels. They started to, to gain momentum. They, they were previously there. But they started to gain momentum by 2008. But afterwards, they realized something. There are several studies showing that biofuels have a net energy guarantee of zero. You are not gaining energy by producing biofuels. Put in other terms, in some sense, the amount of uh, gasoline or, or diesel you're putting in your machines in order to harvest, to, 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 I mean, to show, to harvest and so on, and then gather it and produce in the thing, you put a barrel of gasoline, you're obtaining the equivalent of a barrel of biofuel. So you're not gaining energy. And this is the reason for which it has started to be abandoned at this point. I mean, they're keeping pace, but they are, it's not increasing any longer. This part here is fracking. This is fracking. And fracking, yes, fracking was a game changer. Fracking has introduced a new, um, a big amount. I mean, the fact this is, except for the technical for extraction, it's real conventional oil, maybe about short chains and so on. And this has made a difference. But at which cost? Oil companies are now hasting in the best from non-conventional products, including fracking. So this is the, best in, the investment I have historically made during the previous year. In October 2013, they were saying they were going to keep the, invest the investment until October. This is what they say in October. This is what they say in, in January. This is what they say in March. So what's happening here? Why are they, they are divesting from fracking? Well, because fracking is a ruin. I'm going to explain it later. I think it's not yes, here. You are not here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. OK. Well, uh, running to the conclusions, OK? Yeah. So oof, oof, oof. I just want to explain this because it has to do with the, same, the last thing I have said. This is from a report from the Department of Energy of the United States. The green line is the cash from operation of the 127 bigger oil and gas companies, which includes private and public ones. Because you know that first, right now, the greatest ones are public. And blue line is the expenditures. They are expending right now, and three years in a row, $100 billion more when they are cashing in. So they are producing oil, but at, at a given cost that they are not able to afford. In fact, no, 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 it's not a question. No, 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 no. It's not a question of investment. It's not a question of investment. The question is that if you analyze the energy they are gaining, in fact, they are losing energy. So you lose energy, it's impossible that you can earn money. It's completely impossible. And this is the reason for which they are divesting. I have shown this in the previous transparency. They are divesting from oil. They are giving up with oil. What is going to happen to us if the companies, the oil companies, are investing less and less and less money in producing oil? Because we are going to, you are going to have less oil, for sure. And this is the reason. Because they are losing money. And why they are losing money? Because if you consider the thermodynamics of oil production, what you see is that it's an energy sink. It's not an energy source. It is an energy sink. They are losing more energy than the amount of energy I, I, I obtaining. We are all of, of us adapted to think that the system can grow forever, even if the planet is finite. We are adapted to think that we are going to uh, have the appropriate mechanisms inside the market to get this oil to the market, even if the price is too high, without understanding that price is just a token. It's a proxy. What is important, in fact, is the energy, the underlying energy. And the energy equation is saying us, this is not profitable. Of course, I, I, will, I will also. <laughs> this is the situation right now. Taking into account, what do you mean? 
well, uh, back to, it, it depends. Uh, they have a very bad year on 2000, between 2008 and 2009. But previously, they were always earning more money. I mean, this situation is quite abnormal. It's quite abnormal. You have a period here in which there was a big gap caused by the, the onset of the economical crisis. But before 2008, it was not like that. They were typically earning more money than, than the amount of money they were uh, spending in, I mean, the uses of cash. What is said here, uses of cash. Do they not have enough stock and money to, to keep it going? It depends. Years? Some companies, yes. Some other companies, not. But the problem is that all of them need to present quarter balances uh, offering a good result. Because this is what the shareholders want. So CEOs, in fact, several CEOs have been removed no, they are not lying. Why you say? Well, because they, they seem to be profitable. They are growing. They are growing in the stock no, no, market. No, no. this. Since they are not profitable, they are changing the strategy right now. They have tried. No, no, they are not lying. No, no, no. I, I don't. I don't mean they are lying. They are not lying. In fact, these are public data. They are. Uh, they could, in principle, go on by presenting results at the end of the year. But with negative, year, negative returns. In fact, the problem is that they have presented negative balance sheets during the past three years. And shareholders are, are fed up, are fed up. So in fact, this, this strategy of trying to keep on going uh, has, has caused the, the position to several CEOs. Shell, Shell yes, the yeah, in the past September. So and CEO Shell, when he was removed, said, my largest regret was to invest in fracking. And these were the, the headlines in a Wall Street Journal article. So you know. OK, uh, I'm going to skip this. OK, well, I'm going to skip this anyway. This is about the absurdity of trying to get, well. OK, I think we, we can finish here, um, because it's quite complicated to develop it together. Just to sum up, modern economic theory is in open contradiction with the laws of physics, even if you don't think <laughs> so, I can show you later. It's in open contradiction with the laws of physics, with data and with intuition. Nevertheless, governments all over the world relentlessly apply economic measures, which bring us on an absurd spiral of the grading economy. This is the present situation. Collapse, a real collapse of the society, is not only an option. It's our likely destination if we don't change course. Collapse is something which is not so uncommon in history. In fact, if we collapse right now, if we become in a situation of societal collapse, we will be just the 27th civilization to collapse. The only difference this time is it's a global civilization. This is the only difference. Scientists can make very strong points while denouncing and revealing the inner inconsistencies of present economical measures. And from a point of view, it is more than a service to society. It is a duty. Our lives and those of our loved ones depend on this. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for extending so much. <laughs> Yes, so this uh, it should be criticized, but the what we have is very far from the new market. Yes. The devil is the devil, you say the devil is the detail. Yeah. And then the last comment would be the following. If what you say of the death of companies, of the old companies, is true and they are losing money, your analysis at the end will be done by other people. So we are heading clearly uh, collapse of the time of the Enron in the past, in fact, much bigger. And uh, is this why you are saying that uh, there will be a kind of crash at the end of the year? No. You have made a prediction. This is great. Like, yeah. Yes. Like, uh, for tellers to say, well, the lottery will be another one to end 30. Yeah. This has a risk. Yeah. The lottery comes, you put that check. Yes. You can make a prediction says that uh, by the end of the year, well, middle of the year, beginning of this year, this is the most likely outcome, but this is not not directly linked to oil. Oil is, of course, always there, but it's linked by the evolution of P PMI and other economic advanced economic indicators. So we observe that uh, a fall in the 
purchase, uh, how say, purchase share manufacturer index. It's uh, kind of, uh, you, they make a, a poll among the main purchases, managers of com big companies about their, their orders for requesting new uh, staff in the next month or so on. And they, uh, this is a good predictor. Yes, yes, the yeah, no, but I'm, what I mean is, um, my, my statement, not the real prediction, my statement is, taking into account the advanced economic indicators right now, we are heading up to a new recessive wave. So we need something exceptional to happen to avoid, to avoid this outcome. We need something exceptional to happen. I have not a crystal ball to, fake, to make up, uh, um, how to say, uh, impossible to, to do this, how is my, uh, a prediction, a real prediction, okay? But taking into account the evolution of economy in China, in the United States, in Europe, during the past months and the advanced economic indicators, everything signs up that we are heading a new recessive way. How much it is, how long is going to it to last? How deep is this going to be? It's still a question to debate. It seems it is going to be hard. It seems right now. It is, if it is going to be just a momentary lapse, it may happen. It is not likely, but it may happen anyway. But it has, it, huh? we don't know how deep it is going to be. And right now, with what you see is. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. No, the question is, but, but this is this is true and false at the same time because I can make another a bolder uh, prediction than, than yours. Is in the long run, you will observe that the, sto the stocks will go up and down, but if you take the trend, the trend is to go down. So this is, they are going to oscillate for sure, but in the long run, they are going to decrease. So you, instead of taking uh, the daily uh, marks, you take the, let's say, monthly or the year marks, you're going to observe that the marks are going to be decreasing for the rest of their life. So it's going to oscillate for sure, but the average line is going to decline. And what I'm saying right now is, uh, regarding your question, it seems that we are going to another recession. We have a lot of indicators indicating this, and there is a very bad interaction with the situation with oil production right now, because oil production need a relatively high oil price, and the oil price is collapsing. It's, well, it's not collapsing, but it is decreasing below the uh, marks they are able to support, because they need some prices to keep on with, keep on producing. And the problem is that the present oil, the marginal cost of oil, is very expensive right now. It, 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 is, it has become very expensive right now. With present prices, about 20% of producers will not keep on on their business. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. No, not very low, because uh, we use it to have 20. Yes, but this, this eight is quite, it's quite nauseous for producers. Yes, of course. And it is, this is slowing because of the lowering demand, the faltering demand. The demand is falling right now. China is requesting less uh, oil, less coal, less iron, less everything. And demand is also quite feeble, quite weak in, in Europe. So we are in a situation in which our economies are not able to go on with present prices. So demand is falling, price is falling. But the problem right now is with these prices, several of the producers are going to collapse. I don't, I will not be able to, to run up. Okay. So but how, how, does the, how does the market adapt to this? It's always like this, right? It's always like they are in between that pole. Why well, are you assuming that market is the same kind? No, there is no sequence in the market. These things have to happen. I mean, if things are changing, conditions are changing, then the thing has to adapt. You said it has to adapt. I, I, don't, I don't see your point. But I think that before you said that the distribution of oil in the the banding, then. Of course, and, and this collapse, is collapse is an happiness strategy. In the short run, in fact, you know, there are things that uh, shrink and there are crises and there are this and there are that. But that, how do you know the long run? I mean, no, no, I don't know. No, 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 no. I not no 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 no. I am not saying I don't know the long run. What I know for sure, for sure, looking at the fundamentals, not to the market, which is an abstract entity, which in fact doesn't exist, but looking to the fundamentals and the thermodynamic relations, the amount of energy you are earning. What I can say is we are not going to be able to keep on increasing the amount of energy we are obtaining, and this I can state yes, we are not going to keep on 
having more and more energy every year as we have done during the past century and a half. Yeah, of course. I am not extrapolation of anything about population. I don't speak about population. What I'm saying is the increase, no. I am not, I don't say, I don't know which the precise course of energy will be except that it will not keep on increasing. This is my only real prediction. It will not keep on increasing forever. This is completely different what we are saying. What I'm saying is uh, energy consumption is not going to increase forever. In fact, what I'm saying even more, I say in the next decades, Total energy consumption needs to keep, needs to to stop at some moment, and even even in a later point it needs to decrease. But I don't place a precise uh, date for that. But what I am sure right now is that the energy consumption is not to go keep on increasing forever, and it is going to stop in the following years, one two decades. I agree with you that the situation is going to be far wrong, but for the scientific of what you have said is that any way you modify the situation can have an economical theory and a mathematical theory. And I think that that's possibly wrong. Because the players in the economy are to an extent maybe hundreds of companies that are not their body subject. A lot of architectural objects that know the, the laws they follow, and they can they are paralyzed in some of them, and they can change those laws. Yes, that, that is why they, they make economy and the universal and universal the, the, the novel uh, concept. Yes, change the laws they know they follow. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but anyway, I, I know I make it no I know make it no um, uh, claim that uh, we can mathematize uh, an alternative theory. There are people trying to do that, and their work is interesting. If it is going to be uh, of application in the real world, it's a different stuff, different thing. But I, I, I'm not going so far. I'm saying just yes. uh, our economy, which is based on growth, this is very important. Our economy. I, I have skipped this part. I have skipped this part, but if we want, I can explain. It is based on, on growth because this is a requirement by capitalist system. In a, no, 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 it's not historical reasons. It's a, it's a quite material. I'm sorry, but I want to explain this because it is a crucial point of the talk. No, 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 it's not an assumption. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. Capital needs to regrowth, needs regrowth rates which are above inflation. If you have a capital, you, you want not to lose money. And in a capitalist system as like ours, Capital has the right to be paid, so I put some capital somewhere, and I have the right to retrieve this capital at an interest. And at the time that you put an interest on that, so it is quite simple. Do you, you all know? Let's suppose that you have a quite simple component interest balance, let's say 2.7 percent annual, which is not big for the standards. Okay, so this implies that a uh, uh, doubling rate of uh, of two, 25 years. So in 25 years, if you are having your capital, lending it again and again and again and again at this rate, you're going to double the amount of money you have in 25 years. Is that, that's to mean multiply by 4 in 50 years and multiply by 16 in a century. So the reason for which we are, we are growing and exponentially growing is because, because of interest. And in fact, to produce all this amount of goods, you need to increase the GDP. This is the reason for which we take a, 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 we are so our politicians are so central on GDP because the GDP is giving an expression on the way in, war in which your economy is inflating. And this is giving opportunities for capitalists to invest. 
okay? So you need to produce 16 times more goods. It doesn't imply 60 times more smartphones, but the smartphones having 60 times uh, more uh, value, more price, or having 60 times more infrastructures and having, well, whatever, whatever you want. But at the end, and this is a crucial point, something which is well known is that the greatest contributor, uh, uh, um, for the rest of factors being equal, the greatest contributor to the increase of GDP is population. Because at the end, the amount of things you can spend is relatively limited. But you have another unity of consumption, which is another human individual. No, no, I'm not. I think you're not. No, no, no. I think you are not following my point. Excuse me. Capital needs to grow. Capital needs to grow. And it grows at an exponential rate. Because when you go to the bank and you ask for a loan, they are requesting you a compound interest, for sure. So you are, you are now there. You are now there. If you have that the capital needs to be repaid by a percentage, when you apply it all over the time, if you have a percentage, uh, let's say 3%, it means that every year you need to multiply the amount by 1.03. 1.3 to the 25 power is about you. 50 years, 4. As a century, 16. This is the reason for which it increases. You put, uh, for example, a negative interest, then you fall up in a city. This is very well known. So if uh, you are not lending capital for some uh, uh, gain, then it's better not to lend the capital. In a capitalist system. So everything stops. In a capitalistic, in a capitalistic system. system. So the theory is that uh, you need to have some interest in order to lend the capital. And but so having interest implies uh, exponential growth. Is, uh, yeah. So the problem at the end is that we are playing in a, in a game in which, for the fact of having a capital, you have the right of receiving some money, which is proportional of, to the amount of capital you have. The more capital you have, the more your revenue should be. It's a, it's a constant percentage. So as far as you don't abandon this scheme, you are going to, to fall in a pit, either because you are growing and you are beating the limits of the earth, either because you are falling in a sink. So in any case, you are Is back. it possible to, to put the bound uh, on the interest? To say, you gain something, but it's so small that this exponential growth it's very, very, very small. In fact, uh, the problem is inflation. You need to have a growing factor which is greater than inflation. Uh, yeah, and inflation is kind of a redistribution system, a natural redistribution system, so it's quite hard. It depends, it depends on the person. It depends on the person. Sometimes they take it, they can it, they can out. It depends. It depends on the person. Yeah, it is quite tricky. It's quite tricky. The number of growth that Normally, GDP is they have what they call an uh, an um, deflector de la inflación, uh, inflation inflation deflector. So GDP normally it's it accounts it. And then, and then the question is whether whether after subtracting inflation, whether GDP is going to be the market, free market, but something approximate to that, with zero growth, once you take into account the inflation. So inflation is fine. You need, to, you, you need to go out from the capitalist scheme. You don't consider owners as like population Yeah, yeah. You, you need to go out from the capitalist scheme. That this, that this doesn't work. Oh, excuse me? A, a closed system without growth of population and with zero growth after in fact, historically, it, it, it has, historically, it has been the most common human system in human history. So Over 2,000. I am not ruling out this possibility. What do you say? I am not ruling out this possibility. That this is with capitalism. With capitalism. Capitalism has just two centuries of, uh, of age. No. Capitalism is just two centuries. No. Uh, it exists, and, and it exists. No, no, a capitalist, a capitalism system, it's unstable. A capitalism. Be, but two centuries ago, two centuries ago, we have no capitalism. So for the longest part of... What capitalism is like 
principle that you say. Because people were learning Spanish as speakers. Uh, I, I cannot. Ah? Uh, huh? Mike, excuse me? People were lending money to teachers. This is interesting. As you raise the point, sorry. No, just, just, just. Could you could you read this, please? <laughs> I, I don't know. But anyway, if you're interested, I am going. For instance, you, if you can be uh, at uh, Central Octubre at seven o'clock this evening, I am going to give a specific talk on resources. And maybe some of the questions you have in mind. I'm going to get uh, to, be, to be clear because this seminar is quite long, as we, you have verified, and I have a lot of concepts which are controversial and need to be discussed for sure. But the, right, uh, uh, at seven, I'm going to concentrate on the resource problem, and maybe some of the questions you, you have right now you can answer there. Anyway, Dante in the Inferno put lenders, money lenders, at the bottom of the seventh circle of hell. So historically, people lending money for having a revenue were considered real sinners. In fact, Catholic Church condemned, condemned lending money for interest until the beginning of 19th century. So we, th we tend to think that story, the, the history is more linear than it really is. And we tend to think that what we have now is a very long story of success, and it is not like that. Two centuries ago, we have no capitalism. Two centuries ago, anyone giving uh, uh, lending money for uh, inter compound interest was considered an offender, was considered, considered an, an, a sinner, and for very good reasons, I would say. Even Saint Augustine, I don't know if you know, said that pecunia pecunia patere non potest, which means that uh, money cannot give birth to money. So, and this is also, you go, uh, you go to the Islamistic uh, Islam states, they condemn. Yeah, still forbidden. Yeah, of course, of course. This is hypocritical. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. What. But what I mean is that lending money, having a profit, is not something which is connatural to humankind. It's something which has been very rare that the humankind. It's not only unpopular, but they they understood because they have experiences like this, this one at a, a smaller scale. That when you push something in order to increase, increase, increase. With an economy system which has less energy than ours that could not uh, follow this pace, they discovered that at the end you, you ended up raining. They, they discovered this. They discovered the bad way. So they said, they say, okay, you cannot lend money for a profit. You can lend money if you want, but not for a profit. So just with the, with compromise of returning this money. Gracias.